hello and thank you for joining us for Northwest Newsweek. I'm Riley McManus. First Nation leaders from around the Northwest are reacting to the Pope's Apology Friday. The responses vary, but they share a common thread of hope that the long-awaited move by the head of the Catholic Church might help some of the survivors in their healing journeys. And it's a sentiment echoed by the bishop here in Thunder Bay. Lee Noonan reports. Man Deputy Grand Chief Annabetti Achnipaneskum welcomed the apology but said that it needs to be followed with sincere action. She pointed out that not all residential school survivors accepted the apology and that she would have liked to hear an acknowledgement of the graves that continue to be uncovered at residential school sites. The Catholic Church needs to ensure that this never happens again, that no child that is, um, you know, affiliated with the Catholic Church is harmed in any way. And that goes for all the people around the world where the Catholic Church um, has presence. Chief Peter Collins of Fort William First Nation called the apology a critical moment for the church, highlighting the role the church continues to play in the lives of many First Nations people. You know, to me, it's a historical day for our communities. It's a historical day for the survivors. It's a historical day for the families that in the unmarked graves. That, uh, and I think that's an important message to our communities, our, our families that have been impacted by residential schools, and we're still seeing no generational impacts today. Bishop Fred Joseph Colley emphasized that the work is ongoing within the Catholic Church to rebuild relationships with Indigenous communities. There were four Catholic-run residential schools in his diocese, including St. Joseph's here in the city. And so we have to be take ownership for the wrongs that were committed and move forward from there. And I hope that, you know, whatever little steps we can take, we'll be able to move towards healing and reconciliation. Collins and Achni Paneskum both expressed their appreciation for survivors who traveled to Rome to share their experiences. Neither expect that the Pope will visit Thunder Bay when he travels to Canada, but Achni Paneskum added she hopes he will visit a residential school site such as St. Anne's on the James Bay Coast. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Officials with the Ministry of Labor were on the site at the Resolute Sawmill in Ignace, investigating a workplace fatality. The death occurred Monday evening and was reported to Ignace OPP just after midnight Tuesday. Sources say a woman employed by an outside contractor was crushed in the debarking area of the sawmill. Resolute sent a message to all the employees there saying, the death of a worker is the realization of their worst fears and that it's cooperating fully with the Ministry of Labor. The company has also launched its own probe and says it's determined to get to the bottom of what happened and take corrective action across all their sites. The Ignace Sawmill reopened last year following a two-year hiatus, but the operation has been temporarily halted as a result of the death. Resolute CEO Remy Lalonde and other executives have traveled to Ignace to support those affected by the tragic incident. The emergency department at Red Lake's Margaret Koshner Memorial Hospital is back up and running, following a 24-hour shutdown last weekend due to a lack of physicians. But officials with the hospital say the potential for a repeat incident there or at another hospital in the region is very real. Adam Riley reports. Well, the fact that we have to make a decision to close an emergency department for an entire community who are not expecting it, like, they deserve better than that. This community deserves far better than that. Chief of Staff Dr. Akila Wiley has been practicing at the Margaret Koshner Memorial Hospital in Red Lake for just less than two years. She says the decision to close the ER for 24 hours on March 26th due to a lack of physician coverage was disappointing, but also sees it as a chance to start a dialogue. In making light of the whole situation, a lot of education is coming from it, opportunities like this to talk about it and inform our communities that, you know, we really are in dire circumstances and we're starting to get very, very tired keeping our departments open. The closure meant anyone in Red Lake or nearby Ear Falls would have to travel to Dryden some two and a half hours away for emergency care which did occur as two ambulances were dispatched from the base in Red Lake. The Kenora District Services Board confirms that with both their ambulances gone, the community was without paramedics for several hours. Sue LeBeau is the chief executive officer for the hospital. She says a key problem is a discrepancy between the number of doctors dedicated to the community based upon its population versus the number of people who use the hospital and its emergency department. So we are rated for seven. Um, and that includes um, all the primary care that has to be done 
I mentioned a while ago that we support about 6,000 residents, but what's not counted in there are the uh, miners that uh, fly in, fly out, for instance. There's a whole contingent as well that does that. Um, tourism is another one. When we, uh, when we see tourism ramp up again, our population can get significantly larger in the summer. Red Lake's Chief Administrative Officer says following the announcement of the ER closure, the municipality declared a state of emergency to bring awareness to the situation. This shouldn't happen in Red Lake and it shouldn't happen in any other community. Um, so we're very concerned and, and we're looking for assurances that, that this does not happen um, in the future. And while the crisis has subsided, hospital officials stress unless significant changes are made from a human resources perspective, another closure of the Red Lake's ER or another ER here in the Northwest will only be a matter of time. Adam Riley, TBT News. The emergency room shutdown in Red Lake this past weekend has led to growing concerns that it wasn't an isolated incident and that ERs could suddenly shut down at other smaller hospitals in the Northwest. The Red Lake closure was due to a shortage of physicians and lasted 24 hours from Saturday morning to Sunday morning. The chair of the Northwest Regional Chief of Staff Council, Dr. Sarah Vanderloo, says doctors are the most acute need at the moment but hospitals are also struggling with lack of nurses. She says the staffing problems are very widespread as multiple hospitals have just barely averted ER closures, including her own hospital in Atacokan, where she works as chief of staff. Vanderloo says it's only a matter of time before small and medium-sized hospitals also have to close their ER doors, forcing those needing emergency service to travel elsewhere. It's been at risk for happening for quite some time and especially the last few months and we're anticipating that it will happen in other sites including larger sites such as Sioux Lookout, Kenora which have been very close to closing Dryden um, within the next few months I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if one or more hospitals undergoes a closure much like the one that happened in Red Lake. Vanderloo doesn't believe Thunder Bay is at risk of ER closure at the moment but says if any of the smaller hospital ERs end up closing it would lead to a ripple effect down the system which could affect Thunder Bay Regional. The temporary closure of Red Lake's ER has led to much criticism at the Ontario Legislature this week. On Wednesday, NDP leader Andrea Horvath questioned the Ford's government's commitment to health care in the far reaches of the province. It is unacceptable. It is absolutely not okay question. or safe that this situation exists in our province. My question is, why hasn't Premier Ford uh, done what he needed to do to resolve this? Why has he abandoned the health care needs of Northerners? In fact, our government is taking action to protect the health care needs of Northerners, and I can advise that the ministry, the primary health care branch and capacity and health workforce planning branch, has been collaborating with Ontario Health, Ontario Health North and Health Force Ontario to find a resolution to recruitment and locum shortages by meeting regularly to identify potential opportunities to recruit new permanent or locum physicians. While much of the history making was focused on the Vatican Friday, it was also made in Thunder Bay in Sudbury, as the Northern Ontario School of Medicine officially became Canada's first independent medical school. Corey Nordstrom was on hand for the local announcement, as excitement filled the halls at the newly named Nossum University. Gatherings were held in both Thunder Bay and Sudbury to celebrate the first official day of Nazem University. Dr. Sarita Verma will serve as its very first president and dean, saying they want to be viewed in the same light as Oxford and other world-class institutes. Nazem U will be known for what it does. We're already well known, but we're going to make Northern Ontario the destination of choice for education and training when it comes to healthcare. Verma says the newfound independence will have little to no impact on students during the transition, though there is excitement throughout its two campuses. Dr. William McCready came out of retirement to work with Verma and is thrilled to help shape Nazem's path going forward. To be free to, to collaborate with new partners, to be able to expand our medical education so that we'll have more doctors in the north is just an amazing feeling. The celebration comes on the heels of Ontario officially announcing significant increases to enrollment for Nazem University with 30 more medical degrees and 41 more residency training spots over the next five years. Training more doctors will ensure that Ontarians can access the health care they need when they need it, wherever they may live. 
The last year plus has been a whirlwind for NASM officials, culminating with the Institute becoming Canada's first independent medical school. But the work doesn't end there for Dr. Sarita Verma and company. They need to find board members and fill gaps previously provided by Laurentian and Lakehead universities. Registration and electronic databases for your students that will be registering from Laurentian Lakehead to NASM U, etc. Very close to an agreement with Lakehead on research, faculty cross appointments and animal care. And we'll be working hard for on the facility side to have a good relationship with them. We believe that if we have an agreement on important things like research that we'll be able to move that forward with the rest of it. There's still a need for roughly 300 doctors in Northern Ontario. Now that NASM has more say in what they do, more focus will be generated elsewhere in the north. We want to expand uh, Kenora, Sioux Lookout, Sault Ste. Marie, Hearst, you know, Manitoulin Island. We already have a lot of students and faculty there and we need to be based there too. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. It's another big milestone in the effort to four-lane the Trans-Canada Highway near Kenora. Minister Greg Rickford's office announced today that the Moncrief construction based in Kenora has been awarded the contract to twin Highway 17 in that area. No dollar figure was provided for the big job, which will see 40 kilometres of the highway four lane between the Manitoba and Ontario border and the Highway 17A turnoff to Kenora. Construction on the first section is scheduled to begin this spring, spanning 6.5 kilometres from the border to the Highway 673 turnoff. That phase will create over 300 jobs and should be completed in the summer of 2025. There's no timeline for construction on the other two larger sections as they won't begin until the environmental assessment, route planning and design work are complete. After being delayed by a year due to COVID-19, the numbers of those experiencing homelessness in the Kenora District are out and it shows a considerable drop in the number of people considered homelessness. Those numbers are being welcomed by the Region Services Board, which indicate the strategies they've been employing work. Adam Riley has the details. The affordable housing shortage has certainly become a crisis across the north, and especially in our communities. In 2018, the Kenora District Services Board announced 393 people in the district were experiencing homelessness, with the largest concentration in the communities of Kenora, Dryden and Sioux Lookout with 223, 67 and 66 people respectively. Flash forward to 2021, where the survey process was shifted to bring it in line with other districts with a snapshot in time model, which showed that number dropped to 221 people experiencing homelessness in the district. And once again, Kenora, Dryden and Sulakout being focal points with 121, 37 and 36 people respectively. The survey numbers show that of the 221 people, a majority of respondents were between the ages of 36 and 55, followed closely by the 26 to 35 age group, with 65 of those people stating they had first experienced homelessness below the age of 25, and a whopping 88% of them identified as Indigenous. KDSB Chief Administrative Officer Henry Wall says overall, the drop in numbers reflects the effort the board has put in place with various partnerships over the last three years. In terms of having housing specifically built for the purpose of ending chronic homelessness. And uh, you know whether it's more supportive housing in Sioux Lookout, Kenora, Red Lake, transitional housing in other communities, we're starting to see that that is making a difference, that we are seeing less people experience chronic homelessness. We're seeing less people go through the shelter system. Wall notes since 2011, the demand for affordable housing has grown by 346 percent, which is why housing projects have been given top priority to counter the issue. He says when he moved to the region 15 years ago, affordable housing was being directed towards low-income families and seniors. You fast forward now, and that conversation can include health care professionals, nurses, police officers, paramedics, social workers who cannot find affordable housing or access to housing. And that is making it more difficult to address homelessness is what we do need fundamentally is more homes. And then the other supports can, can do its job as well. Wall says the focus for the next few years is to continue building new housing units with projects in several communities underway or in the planning process and believes with that strategy, homeless numbers will continue to decrease in the district. Adam Riley, TBT News. And when we come back, a dentist in Red Lake who originally hails from Ukraine does what he can from afar to help defend his homeland.
Uh, freedom always wins against tyranny. I just want this win to come faster. It's been more than a month since an unprovoked Russia invaded Ukraine, indiscriminately attacking both military and civilian targets. And while the conflict rages half a world away, a dentist in Red Lake has taken up a collection, raising several thousands of dollars for the defenders of his homeland. Adam Riley has the details. When Russian forces began assaulting Ukraine, Red Lake dentist Dr. Kostyatin Bulyanfidsev says he and his wife were both in a state of shock. Our sleep was affected. We was worried sick. We, uh, we was on vacation at that time when war started. And uh, I think I wouldn't be able to work at that time. And uh, it took myself time to pick up myself piece by piece to be able to come back to work. But when he did return to work, Dr. Costa, as he's also known as, decided to do something while his home country was being invaded and began collecting money that will be used to fight against Russian aggression. So far, his efforts have led to an acknowledgement in the House of Commons. Madam Speaker, they have raised $20,000 and counting, and Dr. Costa has personally committed to matching every single dollar that is contributed. Madam Speaker, it's simply great to see the generosity in our community, and even more so to see the steadfast support for the Ukrainian people. While most fundraising campaigns by various organizations have been directed towards humanitarian efforts, Dr. Costa says this money is specifically dedicated towards defense efforts. Some money went to Ukraine military, some money went to, uh, there is a big foundation uh, called Come Back Alive, and some of them went to local uh, territorial defense forces militia. Dr. Costa came to Canada in 1999 before attending Dalhousie University and later moved to Red Lake to practice dental work. He says while the community he grew up in is on the edge of the conflict, some of his friends and relatives have not been so lucky. As far as I know, some of, some of our relatives on the occupied territories, some of them had to move because their houses got destroyed or there was a real danger to their life. It's, uh, it's uh, very dangerous to people in Ukraine because bombs are falling sometimes far from the battlefields. When asked how long or how much he wants to raise, Dr. Costa says he doesn't have a number in mind, but he does want to see an end to the hostilities as soon as possible. I hope Ukraine win. Uh, freedom always wins against tyranny. I just want this win to come faster. Adam Riley, TBT News. 
It's been a problem in Sioux Lookout for many years and has fueled substance abuse issues in the community of 5,500. Earlier this year, the town attempted to address the issues through a new street level project. However, it has spawned a new problem, bootlegging. Now a collaborative approach from the OPP and the municipality look to tackle both. Adam Riley explains. Alcohol is estimated to be involved in 90-95% of the calls for service in Sioux Lookout and the calls for service are very high on a per property basis. We're among the highest in the province for OPP communities. With that in mind, Mayor Doug Lawrence along with members of the Police Services Board and the Sioux Lookout Ontario Provincial Police Detachment approached the LCBO in January for a three-month pilot project requesting the liquor retailer be closed for one day a week in an effort to curb calls for police service. As part of the project, the local wine and beer distributor inside the Sioux Lookout Fresh Mart also asked to be part of the pilot. The beer store wasn't included. Uh, the, uh, uh, the OPP didn't see that as a high demand uh, in, in the challenges that we're facing. So uh, it's well underway and uh, the preliminary results are, 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 are very good. That It has a positive impact on on things like OPP calls for service. And while they had high hopes for the project, statistics gathered by the OPP indicate a problem has emerged from the limiting of supply. We've seen not so much the decrease in uh, Liquor License Act offences during that day of closure that we should see. So that leads us to believe that there's bootlegging going on in our community. Degagne says this is the first time a formal strategy against bootlegging has been made public. And the OPP has detectives delving into the world of underground liquor sales. But she notes this doesn't directly mean arrests for those caught up in the investigation. We also are able to uh, connect people to programming and meet their needs that way if, if it becomes an addictions issue. We've been working hard with our community partners to provide alternate services if they are in need of substance over those weekends. The project wraps up on April 9th. However, Lawrence says the LCBO has agreed to extend those closure dates as the data collected from the pilot is reviewed. Adam Riley, TBT News. Coming up after the break, former Dryden Police Service officers return to the community, this time with a new uniform. It's been a month since the Dryden Police Service was disbanded and the Ontario Provincial Police assumed policing duties for the community. 
However, the transition wasn't fully completed until Tuesday, when several former DPS officers returned home and were honored with a special welcoming ceremony. Adam Riley has the details. At 6 a.m. on February 24th, the Dryden Police Service gave its final call. One month later, after weeks of training at the Ontario Provincial Police Headquarters in Orillia, 10 former DPS officers returned to Dryden and were welcomed back in a special ceremony at the centre. In attendance was Deputy Commissioner Chris Harkins. He says having the former DPS officers blending with the OPP will benefit both the city and the region. I was uh, able to attend the graduation last Friday and to see the Dryden members join our organization and the expertise and the experience they bring uh, to, our new, to our family is, uh, is incredibly proud. Detachment Commander Acting Inspector Ed Schwastik echoed Harkins, calling the large amount of effort made by all parties involved since the switch to the OPP was first introduced in 2017 and expressed his admiration for the dedication the former DPS officers have for the community. To, to have those officers go away uh, to uh, Aurelia, to the OPP Academy and train for four weeks and uh, then to come back here uh, is uh, really a testament to their um, capabilities. The graduating class of officers was numbered 497 and former DPS constable, now OPP Provincial Constable Kimberly Roethlisberger was a valedictorian. She spoke about both her and her fellow officers' time and training and the bonds all officers have with each other. Dryden is fortunate. They had two police services that had mutual respect for one another and understanding that no matter the call, if an officer was in need, someone was there to help. It didn't matter the shoulder flash you wore or the area you policed. The policing family ran strong in this community. Therefore, this transition will be easy in the sense that we already have such a strong bond. Adam Riley, TBT News. And that wraps up Northwest Newsweek. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again.